Good morning. Today is uh, <clears throat> today is uh, Thursday, twenty fifth of May, two thousand twenty one, and this is the continuation of our physics K three statistical mechanics chapter eight. This is going to be lecture three, and today I'm going to do molecular energies in an ideal gas. So we're going to do the derivation of the molecular energies based on the Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics that we had, we had derived the other day. If you remember, we had said the other day that if it's a, a sort of a large number of particles and the states are distributed continuously rather than discrete states, <clears throat> then we have n epsilon e d epsilon that is the number of the particles in energy e and e plus d e in that small interval of energy is given by g d e g epsilon d epsilon where g epsilon d epsilon is the number of the states number of the energy states between E and E plus D, and F of epsilon, this was the Boltzmann distribution, which is basically the probability of occupancy of a state. So that makes sense, you know, there's the probability of occupancy of the states, and these are the number of the states, so that gives you the number of the particles in E plus D, E, you know. So I'm going to use, and this uh, Boltzmann distribution, you know, we said it was occupancy function. This was A, e to the power minus epsilon divided by kT. That's what we had derived last time. You know. <clears throat> so we're going to apply Maxwell Boltzmann statistics to find distribution of energies among molecules of an ideal gas. Now, energy quantization is not seen in translational motion of, of the gas molecules. So a molecule can take almost continuous values. And n in the sample is considered to be very large. And therefore, we can consider a continuous distribution of the molecular energies instead of discrete values, instead of saying that n1 molecules have epsilon 1 and then 2 molecules have epsilon 2, what we say is that any n epsilon d epsilon is the number of the molecules with energies between epsilon and epsilon plus d epsilon. It's a continuous distribution now <clears throat> because the number of the particles is very large. And here I have simply written n epsilon equal to g epsilon f epsilon and we said that this we had derived it for discrete uh, energy levels but if you have a continuous one you're going to multiply it by d, d epsilon here so this becomes g epsilon d epsilon and f epsilon in the maxwell Boltzmann distribution. <clears throat> Now, so this is our object. We want to find this n epsilon d epsilon for this or this system over here of the ideal gas containing n molecules. So to find that, we have to we we this already know with this guy, you know. And there was an unknown number a, which is the normalization. That's also not known. And we need to find this g epsilon number of the states between e and d. That's what we need to find over here. So that's what I said, first find g epsilon d epsilon. So we know that a molecule of energy epsilon has momentum p. It's the magnitude of the momentum p. And the momentum p, and its magnitude is given by p equal to square root twice me. That's a free particle. And this p is basically square root of px squared plus py squared plus pz squared where a, p, x, p, y, p, z are the three components in the x, y, and z direction. You know. So 
So what we are saying is that each set of Px, Py, Pz specifies a different state of the motion. Each set. So we can imagine a momentum space with coordinate x's, px, py, pz. So there's my momentum space over here. That's your px, py, pz. Mm -hmm. And the number of the states, gp, dp, with momenta whose magnitudes are, they lie between p and p plus dp. So I'm taking the momentum space now, a momentum state rather than energy states. We're going to calculate the momentum space and convert it to the energy state. So the number of the states, GP, DP, that is the states whose momenta lie between P and P plus DP, is proportional to the volume of the spherical shell in the momentum space with radius p and thickness dp, which is 4 pi square dp. All I'm saying is, this, just imagine there is a sphere, and you know, this is your momentum p, and that's its thickness of the spherical shell is dp. You know, there is a spherical shell in the momentum space, and its radius is p, and that's your, the thickness is dp. So every single point inside it will have a set of different set of px, py, pz. And every point in this momentum space is going to specify, it's going to specify a different state, a different momentum space, is a momentum, spa is a momentum state in this momentum space. You know. So we say that the number of the momentum space uh, the number of momentum states in this dp is going to be proportional to the volume of this spherical shell. You know. Larger the volumes, you're going to have more points like this over there, and therefore more of it will be the number of the states. You know. So we can simply say that this, uh, the number of the momentum states, gp, dp, in this spherical shell is going to be proportional to b, where b is your some proportionality constant and this 4 pi I have absorbed over here, p squared dp. So just proportional to the volume of the spherical shell. <clears throat> now we should note that this gp is not the same thing as ge. This is the moment in the space and this is the energy space. So now we can write your p square equal to twice me that we know. And I'm going to differentiate this thing. So I get 2p dp by d epsilon equals to twice m, 2, 2 cancels. And I get my dp equals to m by p d epsilon. So I have a relationship. So basically, I want to convert this guy to ge de over here but we have gp dp. So this dp, I know that what is the relation of this dp with respect to this d epsilon. So what, we know that one. Now, so, and this p, I want to convert it to energy. So I have my dp equal to m d epsilon to m epsilon. So dp is totally as a function of your epsilon, and that's what, my, what we need uh, over here. Now, the next step is uh, that note each, since each momentum magnitude p corresponds to e, each particle that has a momentum p is going to translate into a, some kind of energy E given by E equal to P squared by twice M. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. You know. So note, since each momentum magnitude P corresponds to E, the number of the energy states G epsilon D epsilon between 
epsilon and epsilon plus d epsilon is the same as the number of the states gp dp between p and p plus dp because for each point over here in the momentum space there is a corresponding point in the e space in the epsilon energy space you know <clears throat> so i can say so i can say that g epsilon d epsilon is equal to gp dp and gp dp we have just said that is a b p square dp and we know that p square p square is this guy that is a twice m epsilon epsilon is the energy and dp dp we just calculated this over here m d epsilon divided by square root twice m epsilon so this this cancels and that is your b over here <clears throat> p square is this all right yeah so so that that's that's correct so this going to be b multiplied by twice m epsilon to the power half M D epsilon. <clears throat> that is my G epsilon D epsilon. The number of the states between epsilon and epsilon plus D epsilon, and that's what I wanted. So the number of the energy states G epsilon D epsilon that is equal to that's what I have written over here. Is going to be is going to be um, b and square root two. I have taken out, and this will be your m to the power of three by two, and that's just epsilon to the power of half d epsilon. So we have found out this this formula, which I need over here, and I know this one, so I can calculate my this number over here. So that's what I've done. So the number of the molecules with energies between epsilon and epsilon plus d epsilon is this guy, n epsilon d epsilon, and that was equal to we said g epsilon d epsilon and f epsilon, which is equal to this much. So we can just put this value from here, and if I do that, <clears throat> then I'm going to get that's my so this this has a over here. I have taken this a and this b and this square root two and this m to the power three by two and that's your epsilon square root and that's your d epsilon and that is your just g g epsilon d epsilon term over here and then you're going to multiply it by this this term over here so that's what I have e to the power minus epsilon kt. So basically, in this formula, I just substituted for this one, and for this one, I have substituted this one, and this a I have brought in the front, you know. Now this is a constant a b square root two m to the power of three by two. This is a constant I call it c. So I get n epsilon d epsilon equal to c square root of epsilon e to the power minus epsilon k t d epsilon. That's my formula now for any d e. Now c is still an unknown quantity, which I want to determine. So to find c, we say that the capital N, that is the total number of the molecules in the system, will be equal to n epsilon d epsilon, and if you integrate it from zero to infinity, you know. Because in d epsilon you have n number n, so to get it for the entire energy range, which is from zero to infinity. You have to integrate it from zero to infinity to get the total number of the particles over there. And this I know I'm going to substitute this one from here. So c comes out, and inside I have square root of epsilon e to the power minus epsilon divided by kt d epsilon. And I go to the integration tables, and I have a formula integral of zero to infinity 
square root of x, e to the power minus ax dx equal to 1 over twice a square root pi by a. And here, if you look at this formula, a, a is nothing but 1 over kt. So if I substitute over here, I'm going to get c by 2. This is my 2 over here. And a is 1 by kt, so kt is going to go up. And here also the kt is going to go up, so that's we can make sure kt 3 by 2. And this pi square root pi, I've taken it out. So I get n equal to c by 2 square root of pi kt to the power 3 by 2. And from this I can calculate my c. So c becomes twice 2 pi capital N divided by pi kt to the power 3 by 2. That's my c, you know. So I can plug in the c into this equation and I get my n epsilon, d epsilon. There are a number of the particles in the difference in energy, um, d epsilon. So if I do that, I get n epsilon d epsilon equal to 2 pi capital N pi kt to the power 3 by 2 square root of epsilon e to the power minus epsilon by kt d epsilon. So using Boltzmann statistics, we got the distribution function, you know, over here. If you give me the energy E, then I'm going to give you what is the number of the particles, you know, and, uh, you, know, you know, on that energy level. So this gives the number of the molecules with energy between epsilon and epsilon plus DE in a sample of ideal gas containing n molecules at absolute temperature T. And this, this formula, this NE, I have just plotted over here. So you know this, this guy, let me see the camera. Okay, not too bad. So I plotted N epsilon as a function of epsilon. <clears throat> and as epsilon increases, initially, you know, this, this will increase much faster than this one. And as you increase E further, then this will dominate, you know, it's in, it, is, it will go down much faster than this is increasing. So that's what you get, you know. So when energy is zero, this thing is zero, that's why I have a zero over here. And as the energy tends to infinity, and I've taken this energy in terms of kT. kT, you know, this energy is simply in terms of kT, you know. Epsilon equals to kT, 2 kT, 3 kT, and so on and so forth. And then, you know, it's an exponential curve, it's going to go to infinity, you know. It's not a symmetrical curve, because on this side, you know, it goes to zero, and on this side, you know, it is exponentially decaying. So it is not a, so that's how it looks like, basically. <clears throat> now, now what do you do with this thing? You know, that, that's the question. So <laughs> we're going to do a few things. So we are interested in finding the average molecular energy. What is the energy, average energy of a molecule in this system? That's what we want to find. So we know that the total internal energy of the system, I can find it by, this is E, by integrating epsilon, n epsilon, d epsilon from zero to infinity. Because this is the number of the particles within this dE, and they have an energy E. So if I integrate this thing, so that gives me the total energy in this dE, because these particles have energy epsilon over here, and there's so many particles are there, so that will be the total energy. And if I integrate from zero to infinity, that will give me the total energy of the system. Yeah. <clears throat> so, n epsilon, n epsilon, d epsilon, I just substitute from here, so there's a 2 pi capital N, divided by pi kt square root 3 by 2, zero to infinity, and this, and this makes it uh, epsilon 3 by 2, and then you have this term e to the power minus epsilon by kt d epsilon. And once again, I use uh, integration tables, uh, x integral of 0 to infinity, x 3 by 2, multiplied by e to the power minus ax dx, that is given by 3 by 4a squared, multiplied by square root of pi by a. 
And again, in this case, your A is 1 over KT. So if I do that, <clears throat> if I use this integral over here, I'm going to get E, total energy E equals to 2 pi N divided by pi KT, 2 pi 3 by 2. And if I substitute this integral over here, I'm going to get 3 by 4 KT squared, square root of pi KT. Pi KT, because A is your KT, is going to go up. So that gives you your pi KT over here. And these are, these are A squared, A is your KT, this is that's, you know, and this is a 4 right here, and it's a 3. So if I simplify this thing, it's going to give me 3 by 2 N KT. So the total energy of the system is E equal to 3 by 2 N KT. And therefore, the average of an ideal gas molecule is capital E divided by N, total energy divided by total number of molecules, and I represent it by epsilon bar. So this N, N will cancel out, so you get 3 by 2 kT. And this is the famous uh, equipartition theorem, you know, that your energy is equally distributed among the three degrees of freedom, and you say this particle is simply translation we are considering, so the kinetic energy would be half m vx squared plus half m vy squared plus half m vz squared. That's how it's going to be distributed among the three. <clears throat> half kt is going to be distributed among the three xc's. And uh, this is uh, one of the principal results of kinetic theory of kinetic theory of gases, you know, the equipartition theorem, you know. And we were able to obtain it from purely statistical considerations, and that really shows the validity of the statistical approach to the thermodynamics, you know, because we got exactly the same formula. <clears throat> now, I'm going to do the distribution of molecular speeds in an ideal gas, because this was this distribution was derived by Maxwell a few years ago in 1859, and we want to see if, uh, from statistical considerations, we get the same formula or not. That's the whole idea over here. So Maxwell derived this formula in terms of the speeds, you know. So we have epsilon equal to half m v squared. That's the kinetic energy of the particle, and if I differentiate this thing, I get d epsilon equal to half m, and this will be twice v dv, and therefore d epsilon is going to be m v dv, 2 to cancels out. <clears throat> so, so in this formula, I already know d epsilon in terms of dv, and that's what I want, you know. All right. <clears throat> So right from this thing now, I can straight away write it. Basically, I just need to write it as a function of v. So the constant is the same, 2 pi n divided by pi kt, square root 3 by 2. And square root of epsilon is given by square root of 2, square root of m, v, and that's what I've written here, 1 by square root of 2, square root of m, v. And then I have this guy over here. And this epsilon is nothing but half and v squared. So it is this and kt. And then d epsilon is mv dv. So you just put it all together, just kind of a, you know, so you can see that V and V, that is your V squared, and that is your E to the power minus M V squared twice K, KT dV. That's what you have right here. dV is right here. And, uh, <clears throat> and if you simplify this thing a little bit, so you're going to get N V dV equal to 4 pi capital N multiplied by M divided by 2 pi kt, 2 to the power 3 by 2, v squared, e to the power minus mv squared, divided by twice kt dv. 
So as I said, this matches your Maxwell's derivation of the uh, speed distribution of the molecules in our ideal gas, and it's perfectly Maxwell again. So here I have plotted the NV. There I have plotted NE, and here I have plotted NV as a function of V. Just, just this formula we have plotted over here. And once again, at V equal to zero, this distribution number of the particles is zero. There are no particles with zero velocity. And as you go to infinite, you know, very large velocities, it decays down. So this maximum point over here, obviously, will be the most probable speed because maximum number of particles have this speed and Vp. And I'll show you, it turns out to be square root twice kt divided by m. Let me just... Okay, not too bad. <clears throat> and the average speed uh, of the particle is square root 8 kT divided by pi m, and which is slightly larger than your Vp. And then there's a root mean square velocity. You know, there's a V square average square root that comes out with square root 3 kT divided by m. They call it VRMS also. And that's a little bit larger over here. <clears throat> so let us derive, first of all, the average, average speed of the molecules in this ideal gas system. So V bar, all right. So, no, let's just do this thing. That's what I've done over here. So I guess I'm going to derive the VRMS. So we know that the average, you know that epsilon equal to half mv squared. So epsilon bar is going to be half mv squared bar. You know, these are the averages. <clears throat> and this I know, this guy is from, you know, we just derived it. This was, epsilon bar was 3 by 2 kT. So I can calculate my v squared bar from here. It will be your 3 kT by 2 m. 2, 2 cancels out, so it will be 3 kT by m. And you take the square root of this VRMS, it will be 3 kT by m. And that's what I have over here. Now then I'm going to derive the V bar. So you remember the X bar, the average of any quantity is basically your expectation value, which is Ni Xi divided by summation of Ni, <clears throat> where you know what Ni and this implies over here. So I have for Ni Xi, I have N, Nv, 